All right, uh, last lecture of chapter one. Very, very important um, talk, and we're going to spend a lot of time working on this in class, or a little bit of time working on this in class. Um, a lot of this you should remember from chemistry one, uh, and it's in talking about uncertainty and measurements. So when we take measurements in the world, there are two types of numbers. There are exact numbers or we typically refer to them as counting numbers or defined numbers for example if there are 24 people in this room there are exactly 24 people in this room not much room for error um, and we have inexact numbers as our other type of numbers they are derived from a measurement so if we get out our uh, triple beam balance or if we get out our graduated cylinder or if we get out our um, centimeter ruler there's going to be a little bit of error because not everyone reads the instruments the same exact way all measurements have a certain degree of uncertainty or error associated with them if I gave um, the six different groups in this um, class a ruler to measure the length, width, and height of the classroom, I would probably get close to six different measurements. That just depends on how you read your you would read your tape measure. But we typically refer to measurements as being with two different uh, properties. The first of which is being accuracy. Okay, and accuracy tells how well measured quantities agree with the true value, or it refers to the proximity of the measurement close to the true value. Alright, so if we're looking at a target <clears throat> and the true value or the accepted value is in the middle or if you're throwing a dart at this target you're most accurate if you're hitting the center of the target or you're most accurate if you're getting close to the accepted value. Another term we use to describe measurements is precision. Now precision tells how well measured quantities agree with each other or how close they are to each other. Okay? How close they are to each other. For example, on this dartboard, we have measurements on this dartboard, or we have darts thrown at this dartboard. Now, they are very precise. They all hit the same place. So we can say that these measurements are very precise, as well as the ones in the top um, dartboard, because they're all very close together. Now, in the second dartboard, they are not very accurate. While they're very precise, the person who was throwing the darts was very precise as to where he put his darts. They are not close to the accurate value. Another term, or the last thing we can talk about, is having poor accuracy and both both poor accuracy and poor precision. If you're just throwing darts, if you if you play darts like I do, your darts probably end up all over the place and nowhere near the target. So I could say that I have poor accuracy and poor precision. Last year, if you were in my Chemistry 1 class, you saw, or I used a golf analogy. If you want to take a second look at the video to um, better talk about this, I would encourage you to get, do so. Go over to the Chem 1 site and look at the um, video. Now, how do we determine how precise a measurement was? Well, we use the term called significant figures. In a measurement, it is useful to indicate the exactness of a measurement. The exactness is reflected in the number of significant figures. The term significant figures refers to the number of digits that were measured. Now, when rounding calculated numbers, we pay attention to significant figures, so do we do not overstate the accuracy of our answers. Significant figures tell other scientists how good or how exact their measurements were or how exact their instruments were when um, they are uh, studying the same types of systems. Now, let's talk about the rules or guidelines for determining the significant figures. Number of significant figures in the known the number of significant figures is the number of digits known with certainty plus one uncertain digit. For example, if I have 2.2405 grams, mean that we are sure that the mass is exact to the um, thousandth place, but we are uncertain about the nearest 0 .001 gram digit. 
That means that we have to take, and when making a measurement, we always estimate another um, digit on the end. We have to look at our scale and estimate another digit beyond that. To help with this, you may get from the Chemistry 1 lectures again. Now, let's talk about the rules for counting significant figures. Non-zero digits are significant to us. Any number that is not a zero is a significant figure. Zeros between the two zeros between non-zero numbers are themselves significant. So, if we have numbers, if we have zeros that are in between two significant figures, or they are sandwiched, we call them captive zeros. They are in between two zeros. They are significant. Zeros at the beginning of a number are never significant. We consider these leading zeros. And zeros at the end of the number, trailing zeros, are only significant if a decimal point is there. Okay, so what does this all mean? Well, how do we what, what do we, how do we determine if a number is a significant figure? Well, really, there are two things you got to look at. If it starts with if it's a leading zero, the number is never significant. If it's a trailing zero, it's only significant if there's a decimal located anywhere in that number. Captive zeros or the ones in the middle are significant. Non-zeros are significant. Now, how do we calculate with significant figures? Well, when adding and subtracting, we report to the least significant number of decimal places. The least significant number of decimal places. When multiplying or dividing, Answers are rounded to the number of digits that corresponds to the least number of significant figures in any of the calculations. Now we're going to work a little bit on this in class, so don't don't kind of uh, don't fear if you're kind of lost here. Um, but yeah, I would suggest taking a look at the Chemistry One lectures as I go into much greater detail with these calculations. Now let's talk about dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis is quite important in Chemistry One. Um, we spent a lot of time doing dimension analysis. You may refer to them as the boxes. I do a little bit different in chemistry, too, just because um, it's uh, quicker to do it this way. But dimensional analysis is simply a problem-solving step that we used for most everything in chemistry. We use this dimensional analysis to convert from one quantity to another. <coughs> now... Most commonly, dimension analysis is used for conversion factor, and conversion factors are used to manipulate these units. A desired unit is equal to the given unit times its conversion factor. Now, we can state conversion factors in several different ways. Here, we have an equality statement where one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. We can take these equality statements and convert them into fractions. And as long as this is equal, we can reciprocate this any way or we can manipulate this any way we need to. Um, conversion factor is equal to desired unit divided by given unit. These are fractions whose numerator and denominator are the same quantity, just expressed in different units. Well, one inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters, so this is pretty much saying one divided by one is one. Um, just we're using a different unit to indicate or to go with a different number to make them one. Now, use the form of the conversion factor that puts the sought for unit in the numerator. For example, if we're starting off with a given unit, we're going to put that given unit at the bottom of the next box or at the bottom of the next fraction. Remember, we're going to multiply all these. And the desired unit is going to go on top. <clears throat> For example, in order to convert 8 meters to inches, we must first begin by converting meters to centimeters. Well, what do we do? Well, we start off with 8 meters. In order to go from meters, since we meters is our desired unit, it's going to go at the bottom of the next fraction, or the bottom of the next box, and centimeters is going to go at the top. We should know that there are 100 centimeters in 1 meter. Where do we get this from? Well, we get this from our metric system prefixes. Okay, that leaves our units in centimeters now. Now, centimeters is what we are given. We have to go from centimeters to inch. We do that by using our English conversion factor that um, 
we should know as well, 2.54 centimeters is equal to 1 inch. We multiply everything together, so 8.0 times 100 divided by 1 times 1 divided by 2.54 centimeters is equal to 315 inches. Now we will work more with dimensional analysis a little later. But let's talk a little bit, let's, let's kind of think about dimensional analysis. There are really three questions we need to ask ourselves. What are we given? What quantity do we need? And what conversion factors do we need to go through? So, we are given meters in this one, and we're trying to go to inches. So we're starting with meters. Inches is our ultimate goal. We have to determine which conversion factors are first going to take us from meters to something we can work with in inches. Do we know a conversion factor that goes straight from meters to inches? Absolutely not, but we can go to centimeters. Simply multiply and divide. 